Welcome to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Hello, I am the Reverend Dr. Bill White, Jr., and I serve as the Director of Equity and Justice Ministries for the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Thanks for listening. Joining us today is the Reverend Dr. T. Anthony Spearman. Dr. Spearman is an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and is the immediate past president of the State Conference of Branches of the North Carolina NAACP and a past president of the North Carolina Council of Churches. Dr. Spearman is presently a member of the Guilford County Board of Elections and served as a member of the Hickory Public School Board from 2011 until he was relocated to Greensboro in 2014. Dr. Spearman has been involved in community activism for the past 52 years. He believes that courage is the foundation for acts of civil disobedience. Dr. Spearman has an extensive CV and resume an extensive bio, and we simply wanted to share highlights of that today. Dr. Spearman, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. White. I appreciate being here. Well, thank you for joining us. We we go way back, Dr. Spearman. You've... Indeed, indeed. <laughs> You've known me most of my life, if not all my life, and you knew my late father and you know my mother. I'm just glad that we can have this opportunity today as we celebrate the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is remembered indeed as a drum major for justice. Thank you, Dr. Yes, Spearman. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Dr. Spearman, there's so much happening in our world and in our communities, and you've been very active in our community, in the efforts of civil rights, working with NAACP, what do you think were a couple of the most significant accomplishments of the North Carolina branch of the NAACP during your tenure as president? Thank you for the question, Dr. White. And that is indeed a question that, as I ponder, I would have to say that for me, one of the most important accomplishments occurred back in 2018, when not too many people had awareness or had caught on to the methodology that was occurring within the Congress of the United States of America, and how a gentleman named Leonard Leo, who was a vice president for the Federalist Society, along with Mitch McConnell, were working assiduously to ensure that conservative jurists were appointed to lifetime seats in federal courts across the nation. We here in the state of North Carolina were well aware of what was going on because we had been in the forefront of the battle for voter suppression or against voter suppression. And at that particular time, they basically be beginning in 2015, well, 2013, actually, when the Supreme Court came back with the decision to uh, eviscerate the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we had a lawsuit wherein we were fighting against voter suppression in the form of voter photo voter ID. And the gentleman who was the lawyer for the defendants was a man named Thomas Farr who got onto the nomination list of president, and that's one of the first times I've called him by that name. I usually refer to him as number 45, who he got onto the list of nominees for offices and leadership in the courts. We in the state of North Carolina were not happy with that. And so we decided that what we were going to do is that we were going to oppose him full throttle. And so in 2018, we traveled. I took a delegation to Washington, D.C., where in February of the year, we fought the nomination and then had to return nine months later in November of the year to oppose the confirmation of Thomas Farr to the Eastern District of the federal courts here in the state of North Carolina. 
and we succeeded. They said it couldn't be done, but we succeeded in our venture. When Tim Scott, we were able to convince Tim Scott down in South Carolina that it would be an appellation to allow that man to serve in a lifetime seat in the state of North Carolina. And so that, that for me is probably the foremost accomplishment that I, I can refer to because one of the reasons is because back in 1930, I'm not sure if you know or are aware, but I know you're a historian and so you probably are, that there was a gentleman that Herbert Hoover, I believe it was, tried to get into a seat as the, in the Supreme Court, John J. Parker. And the NAACP rose up and fought against him the NAACP at that time was able to keep him from occupying the seat on the Supreme Court. So the courts, as it appears today, is the branch that seemed here in the state of North Carolina to be the branch that would provide some hope for us. And when I say us, I'm talking about African-Americans as a people. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Spearman. I know that is one of many accomplishments. And as you stated, you're continuing the rich history and legacy of justice issues, particularly as it relates to the courts. There is a history of racism in our country. A new generation has literally seen on camera phones incidents of racism and violence perpetuated against people of color, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latinx, and others. As an African-American, a Black male, a pastor, civil rights leader, what do you say to this new generation about racism and justice? How can they confront those issues of racism and justice? That question, I have to respond to it in this wise, yes. Dr. White, because I've been alive now for 70 years. Come my birthday in April of this year, I will be 71 years old. Thanks be to God. And etched in the corners of the recesses of my mind is the image of Emmett Till. I was four years old when he was brutally murdered. And I'll never forget opening up the pages of the Jet magazine back then and seeing him in that coffin that his mother allowed to remain open so that the world could see what they had done to her son. And that image is one that probably propels a great deal of the work that I do in the areas of racism and justice. And it does not appear to me, especially with the frame that many folk here in America put around justice. And what I mean by that is they frame it by referring to it as social justice, which I believe is a tremendous disservice because anytime you have to put an adjective in front of the powerful term justice, you are really relegating yourself to doing something very dangerous. Here in the United States of America, I would suffer to say that as long as racism prevails, justice and when I'm talking about just, I'm talking about divine justice will be derailed. There's little chance that those who have the rich use of the brown color and black color to their skin will ever be able to prevail when it comes to justice. And so I genuinely and generally, when I'm speaking to young people, I always make them aware that they're going to have a difficult time here in the United States of America, and that may be our lot. And if it's our lot, one of the things that we must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves to be able to do is to govern ourselves by the imago Dei, the, the image of God that we all have been created in and by. And once we are able to ascribe to that, then the color of our skin, we, we can rise above what people refer to as the color of our skin. And so trying to give these young people, this new generation, these upcoming generations, that awareness is, becomes the main part of, of my lot and what I 
try to help them to be raised by. Thank you, Dr. Spearman. You mentioned some very key words and points that I want to highlight. The last being awareness. You mentioned for this new and upcoming generation to be aware of these issues. You mentioned the Emmett Till photo, Mm -hmm. and I'll share with you, I've seen it many years, for many years in various places. And most recently, the cabinet of the North Carolina and West North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church toured the Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that tour, there are photos of the horrors and terror and tragedies that were inflicted upon Blacks. Huge pictures on the wall. And one of the last pictures was that of Emmett Till. Yeah. And it brings to mind that even, I guess, the past couple of days, there's been a TV show, Women of the Movement, the uh, heroic true story of Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till. I have not seen that, but look forward yeah. to viewing that. So when you talk about awareness and history, it's important for our uh, young people to be aware and for us not to forget. You talked about justice, and I appreciate you saying that it's important not to put an adjective in front of the word justice. And you spoke of divine justice. And so could you say a little more about that, please? Yeah. About your definition of justice and what that means for, for our country and for the church. At one point when we were as a member of the North, North Carolina NAACP, and I've been a member of the NAACP since my father made my sisters and I members when we were, when I was 12 years old. And daddy, one of the reasons why I remained loyal to the NAACP is because my daddy told us that you have to keep our memberships up in the NAACP because we're fighting for justice for the rest of our lives. And certainly my dad's words were prophetic. You know, they were very prophetic. And so as people were, as I was becoming no, a noted figure in, in civil rights and what have you, people were, would refer to me as a social justice advocate. Mm. And I had to rise up against that at one point. It was at one of the historic thousands on Jones Street rallies that we've been having here in the state of North Carolina for, for some years now. And I stood forth and I said, please don't refer to me as a social justice advocate for the reasons that I just just finished stating that, you know, when you confine or compartmentalize justice to one aspect like social, you know, criminal justice, environmental justice, you're limiting the power of God to work as God works, as Mm -hmm. you and I well know, God cannot be limited. He cannot be confined to compartments. And so I'd rather be referred to as an advocate of justice, because as far as I'm concerned, when justice is spoken of in the book that I become so very fond of, in the book of Deuteronomy, the second law, it says in the 16th chapter and 20th verse, follow justice, not social justice, justice, follow justice and justice alone so that you may love and possess the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So we must never forget how that verse is prefaced by the 19th verse where the Deuteronomist cautions us not to pervert justice or show partiality when it comes to the enjoying of justice. That's why I try to open people's minds and, and, and their awareness to justice and the order of saying. As a matter of fact, you, you can trace that term social justice. And when you trace it back to its origins, you'll find that it may not be exactly what you think it is. <laughs> so uh, it would be it's, it, it behooves folk to really do some research and see where jo- social justice leads you to. So I don't want to be a part of that kind of thing. So I hope I've said enough. Uh, Dr. Spear, that, that is very helpful. That is very helpful. And some of us who are listening will have homework to do <laughs> to follow up and do our research and, and to read and to study. Dr. Spearman, what role should the church play in addressing these issues of justice? And when I say the church, speaking of the church universal, not necessarily denomination, but what role should the church play in addressing these issues of justice? Wonderful question. Wonderful question. As we are focusing on Dr. King, one of the most practical, and, and by the way, I was, I was enamored by Dr. King all of my life. 
And when I was a teenager and an enthusiast of his, I just, my, I had an aunt, an old of my, one of my aunts who's gone on to glory now, she was a domestic worker and she would bring home to me some of the Life magazine and, and all of those magazines. And I would cut out and paste into a scrapbook everything that I could find on Dr. King and on John F. Kennedy at that time. So, oh. and, and of course, when he was killed, my hope was dashed. Yes. But one of the most practical and hopeful sermons that Dr. King has preached and has been inspiration, a source of inspiration for me, was entitled, A Knock at Midnight. And in that message, he used this as his scriptural context, Luke's 11 chapter, verses 5 and 6. There you'll find a parable where he talks about which of you has a friend who will go to his friend at midnight and say to him, I need some, something to eat. I need, you know, and, and, and the friend talks to, and he asks for three loaves for a friend of his that is coming and he didn't have anything to set before him. Well, uh, King takes that, he takes that and he develops one, one of the most remarkable sermons that I know that, that points to, that begins to point to the, some of the things that are occurring in the church universal that we need to take a look at and begin to reckon with because in those days that King was preaching, as we all, as we both know, there was a profound social and human predicament that our nation was facing. And our, if we be truthful about it, our nation is still facing probably even more profound, the predicament that we were in when, when King was walking the face of the earth. So there he talks about, he identifies the three loaves as the loaf of the loaf of faith, the loaf of hope, and the loaf of love. And, and oftentimes when the knock comes at midnight to the church, mm. the church, Dr. White, is unresponsive, mm. is not answering the knock at midnight, which as King, as he describes in the sermon, you know, led to the uh, law case that was going on at the time that led to the Mississippi, the bus piece. I'm so wrapped up in passion right now. Yes, I can't no, even call it. Yes, name. that's right. The, yeah, the bus, yeah, that was going on. So anyway, that sermon, I think, gives a message or leaves a message, sends a message to the church today that the church needs to reckon with. Why is the church unresponsive mm. to so many groups of people that are, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and the church is not there. It's midnight in our world. And if the church who, you know, the spring, the source of hope, cannot give us some answers in this midnight, then where, where are we? Where are we? Amen, Dr. Spearman. That, that is indeed true and so very powerful and appreciate your passion in sharing that. And you've challenged us and reminded us that we of all people must answer the knock at midnight. One final question, Dr. Spearman, and when I say final, I mean for this podcast. I hope we will uh, be able to have further conversation. Oh, I hope so. Uh, how can wounds be healed and bridges of reconciliation be built to create the beloved community that Dr. King envisioned? One of the other reading materials that I have a great deal of appreciation for is a text that was written by Dr. Vincent Harding entitled Martin Luther King, The Inconvenient Hero. And in that book, Dr. Harding refers to a comment or remark that Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel made of Dr. King. And, you know, they were very fast friends, but he said that King was a voice, a vision, and away. And the whole future of America, this, this came from the lips of a rabbi, and the whole future of America will depend on the impact and influence of Dr. King. That is a powerful, powerful statement coming from a, another man, a person of faith, about another person of faith. And I think just, you know, really enlivens how 
if we are courageous enough, we can definitely prove ourselves to be men and women of God by stepping out of our own faith perspective into some other faith perspective, as it sounds as if Rabbi Heschel has done. And I I genuinely believe that to be truth and fact, because as I, as as a young child, was following Dr. King and continue to follow Dr. King, I cannot come up with too many folk, Dr. White, that I believe had the quality of faith that Dr. King had. I I read somewhere that he had said that someone, and I quote this, someone must have religion enough and morality enough to cut hate off and inject within the very structure of the universe that strong and powerful element of love. Mm. That's what made him such an inconvenient hero, and he continues to be an inconvenient hero. And every time I am pushed to the margins and pushed to those places of having to demonstrate some kind of courage that's going to make some change and lasting change in this world in which we live, those are some of the things that I think about with Dr. King. I I cannot get off this line without mentioning that most recently I had the opportunity and it was the voice of God that led me on September 23rd to get up out of my bed and travel to Raleigh, North Carolina after viewing some of the images on the television of the border police, patrol police, as they were beating, uh, they were on their horses beating people from Haiti. The voice of the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, that's not just happening at the border. It's happening right under your nose Mm. in a place that I was, I had become an advocate for in, and that's in the, in the realms of criminal injustice. And so I got up out of my bed and I went to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I sat for 70 days across the street from the governor's mansion where we were demanding pardons for four, well, three African-American men and one Caucasian man who had been exonerated from the courts of law for what they had been accused of, and now they were waiting for pardons, some as long as 13 years, languishing, waiting for pardons for crimes that they had not committed. And it took 52 days before the governor of the state of North Carolina decided to go ahead and and grant the pardon for one of them, and then subsequently Second one has gotten his, but there's two more that are still waiting for pardons. Those are the kinds of things that I'm going to fight against for the rest of my life. And I believe those are the things that Dr. King would would say, well done, too. So it is, as it relates to some bridges of reconciliation being built, create the beloved community. That's Those are the kinds of measures that we're going to have to rise up to, to be able to change this world in which we live. Yes. And one of the key words you mentioned, Dr. Spearman, was love. And one of the things that I've talked about being an advocate of is for us as children of God to share space, to work together, be in community together in order to dispel stereotypes. Yes. Oftentimes we base our opinions on what we see in the media and other areas. Yes. And it would be a wonderful thing for us, whether it's an outreach ministry, worship, after school tutorial programs, et cetera, to share in outreach, share in ministry, share in programs together, sharing resources and sharing space. We talk about hospitality. We talk about sharing space, not just yes. physical, but also in our hearts. And so as you talk about love and healing wounds and and building bridges of reconciliation, I appreciate you highlighting the word love and the efforts to bring about justice in all areas of our community, including the areas where there is criminal injustice. If I may, one other thing you just you just made me think of. Yes. And it's something that I would hope that those persons who are have been called by God, would be able to begin wrapping their minds around because I think it's going to be able to be something that would be extremely helpful to us. And I'm mentioning this because I think that you're, as I re- remember your dad, mm-hmm. 
who was my wife's pastor there in Detroit, Michigan. We still have a picture here in our house up of your wow. father. And that's why I always ask about your mother. But we have to help teach people. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it can be taught, but it certainly can be embraced mm -hmm. to speak, learn how to speak to men's and women's hearts mm -hmm. as opposed to speaking to their minds. Mm -hmm. Your dad had that. I believe your dad had that gift of being able to speak to people's hearts as opposed to speaking to their minds. When you speak to a person's heart, you can make so many advances. I had a young man call me this morning who I hadn't heard from in quite some time, who he was in court, something has happened and he's, 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 wound, he's wound up in court and he needed some guidance. Yes. And you know, the thing I, 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 he only reached out to me because I spoke to his heart, not to his mind, but also I wish that he had called me sooner so that I could have probably been there with him in court. Mm. And I would have done that. But, but I think that's something that people that we need to take into consideration as we are dealing with so many and various measures that are incomprehensible here in our world today. So let's hopefully have people rise up and be able to speak to men's hearts yes, and not yes, their minds. Yes. Dr. Spearman, this conversation has been rich in so many ways. And I, again, want to thank you for taking the time to, to join us and share with us. And also thank you for your stupendous and faithful leadership, all that you have done and all that you will continue to do. And as we close, I want to thank those who are listening for joining us for this Means of Grace podcast, which is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We invite you to share another podcast and to share this one. We look forward to having many, many more. We look forward to future conversations with Dr. Spearman and others. And we pray that wherever you are and whatever you're doing, that God will continue to bless you and keep you in God's care. Peace and love. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We hope you enjoy listening to these podcasts and use them as a way to stay connected to our community. Remember to subscribe to Means of Grace for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us an honest rating and a review. It helps others find this podcast. Follow the WNCC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WNCCUMC. Once again, that's at WNCCUMC. Means of Grace is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church and Andy Go of Gojo Studios.